we think about the account of the birth of Jesus, Mary's song, often known as the Magnificat, may be less familiar to some of us. But today on Truth For Life Weekend, Alistair Begg shows us that this brief song of praise contains powerful lessons about the nature of God. Our teaching today comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1. There is nothing in all of fiction that is quite as fantastic as the truth of the Incarnation. Uh, It is impossible for any of us to arrive at such a belief simply on the basis of natural reason. The only way that a man or woman ever comes to such convictions is as a result of God's amazing grace and goodness, whereby He opens eyes that by nature are blind, ears that by nature are deaf, and hearts that by nature are hard. Something that nobody can do for another, no mom can do for her son, no father for his daughter, no uncle for his niece, no pastor for his people. It is a work of grace from beginning to the very end. That is then what humbles us when we study the Bible, and also which fills us with great hope, because God loves saving people. And this morning we end with this thought. Not the how, uh, or or, or the when, or, or, or the where, but the why. Have you, thought, have you thought about that? Why, we ask reverently, did God go to the bother of doing this? The creator of the universe, who is self-existent, who needs no one and nothing, who is perfect in the Trinity, in with framework of relationships which are perfect, it's not as if he needed somebody to spend time with. He has acted entirely, volitionally, purposefully. Why? Why? Why come? Why take on human nature? Why take on all the essential properties and frailties of humanity except for sin? Well, Gill, John Gill, one of the Puritans, gives it to us in a sentence. The moving cause of the incarnation of Christ is the love of the Father and of the Son to mankind. All he is saying there is John 3, 16. For God so loved the world—that's the moving cause—that He gave His only Son, His one and only Son, so that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. You see, somehow in the mystery of eternity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit covenanted with one another for the redemption of men and women, and determined, essentially, who would do what. They realized that it was going to be impossible for mankind to enter their presence, because mankind by nature is all spattered with sin. It's all over us. We haven't loved God as we should. We haven't obeyed His law. We have been jealous. We've been spiteful. We've been mistrustful. We've been arrogant. We've been covetous. Goodness, we we don't even want to think about it. We're only talking about this morning so far, many of us. If if you'd only sinned once a day for your entire life, and you're 20, that would be enough sin to have to go somewhere and get it dealt with, wouldn't it? You do the math on your own. That's fine. No, we're all spattered over. And so God determined that on account of His love for us, His cradle would would be a spattered over feed box, and into a slobbered up feed box God comes because He knows that we are all spattered up with sin. He covers Himself in this ignominy in order that we who deserve nothing may be covered in His glory. And the moving cause is love. Love. That's why we're able then to make sense of the Incarnation. Oh, it is because He loved us. And then when we look at the cross, we're able to look back and say, oh, that is why He came. Once again, Augustine, he says it is from the cross, or the cross is the pulpit from which God preached His love for the world. Now, it is in light of all of this 
in a Christology that is unfolding, that Mary sings her song. We began it last time. My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. He has looked on the humble estate of his servant. I'm going to be called forever and ever now blessed, because the one who is, whose name is holy is mighty, verse 49, and he is merciful, verse 50. We'll just note those two uh, adjectives, shall we? That this God is a mighty God. And Mary's been made aware of this in a very personal way. The Holy Spirit has overshadowed her. The child to be born of her is born of the Holy Spirit. Matthew has told us in his gospel that this has come about in fulfillment of the word of the prophet, that a virgin will conceive and bring forth a son. The way that Mary puts it is that he has shown strength with his arm. It is an accommodation to us in order that we might picture the exodus from Egypt. He stretches forth his arm. He intervenes. He is personally engaged. His might is displayed in the strength of a man's arm. God is mighty. That's why we teach our children to sing, My God is so big, so strong, and so mighty. There's nothing that he cannot do. That's what Mary's singing about. And in a culture that lays great stress on being self-assured, powerful, and rich, God, we're told here, reverses the human opinions of significance. That's what she's going on to say. When God spoke through the prophet Jeremiah to his people of old, this is what he said, "'Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom, or the intelligent boast in their intelligence, or the mighty man boast in his might, strong man boast in his strength, or the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts boast in this, that he knows and understands me." What a strange way for God to work. Well, I think it is a strange way, isn't it? He didn't come to a palace. He came to a, a stable. He didn't wear a crown that was full of beautiful jewels. He wore a crown that was made of thorns. He had no beauty that we should imagine him to be the obvious quarterback of a high school team. No, no. So look at what she sings. This God who is mighty and merciful, number one, he scatters the proud. He scatters the proud. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. I'm a big deal. No, you're not. You, you, you exist for a very short time, and you go away. Nobody knows where you are. Nobody knows where you've gone. Nobody can even find your grave. He scatters the proud, brings down the powerful, brings down the mighty from their thrones. Nebuchadnezzar, look at this place that I've built. Look at these gardens. Look at my majesty. Look at my wealth. Anybody seen Nebuchadnezzar? Yeah, he's, he's been crawling around uh, down in the bottom of the property for a, quite a while now. He's not a pretty sight. He brings down from the thrones, and he disperses the prosperous. The rich he has sent away empty. So God is mighty, but he's also merciful, verse 50. And his mercy is for those who fear him. You see, God brings people down in order to raise them up to newness of life. That's the difference. That's why it's very important to understand that the mighty God is the merciful God, that he opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And his majesty and his might are displayed in part in his mercy. That's why Jeremiah, who's the one who said, let not the man boast in his wisdom, and so on, is also the one who wrote, it is on account of the Lord's mercy that we are not consumed. Because notice this, that if it is bad news for the proud and the powerful and the prosperous, it is good news equally for the humble, verse 52 and he exalts those of a humble estate. Those who are humble enough to say, I don't actually have it all together. I do need to be forgiven. I have actually made quite a mess. He, he comes to that humble heart, and also to the hungry heart. He fills the hungry with good things. He's filled the hungry with good things. David Myers, in his book, The American Paradox, from which we've quoted before, uh, has as the subheading to that book, spiritual hunger in an age of plenty. So what about the hungry? Well, it's the spiritual hunger, ultimately, that God comes to satisfy. 
There is a spiritual vacuum at the very core of American society this morning. And it's amazing to me how many people are prepared to acknowledge it. It's an easy thing for somebody in my position to say you expect that. That's what you expect the religious boffin to say. And I can go down the line and turn. The solution is not agreed upon. The condition is undeniable. Who answers the hungry spiritual heart? Where is that answered? Why is it that man, with all of his scientific advance, chases down all these old-fashioned roads? You hear really smart young guys talking about, well, I think I'm going to go to Tibet, because in Tibet they understand peace and tranquility and so on. Pardon? And why are you even looking for it? I don't know. Do you realize that Jesus, the incarnate God, is the one who will satisfy that spiritual hunger, if you're humble enough to admit your need? So for the humble and the hungry and the helpless, he helps the helpless. He has helped his servant Israel. You say, well, they weren't helpless. Well, yeah, actually, they were helpless. You think of the beginning of humanity, and Adam and Eve sin, and now they're naked, and they're running around hiding. And God comes to them, and he calls out, where are you? And they said, well, can't say just at the moment. They can't, they have no means by which to deal with their predicament. And God, the mighty one, who banishes them from the garden, is the merciful one who provides the clothing that they require, who covers over our nakedness. God does. Who is able to take them from their entrapped condition under the bondage of the tyranny of the Egyptian rulers and set them free? Only God, the mighty one, and the merciful one, who might justifiably have said, you made your bed, lie in it. Who then is able to take them in their wilderness wanderings with one step forward and two steps back and still bring them through as promised, the promises that he has made to Abraham and through Abraham to the seed of Abraham? Only a God who deals with the humble and with the hungry and with the helpless. We could say far more about that, but I, I don't want to. I want to finish by making two observations, one invitation, and a final affirmation. Observation number one, Jesus is inescapable. Try as you might to avoid him, you'll never do it. You may run around with your fingers in your ears and your hands over your eyes, but you will discover again and again, sometimes simply when you put your hand in your pocket and take out a coin, that we are where we are today because, essentially, the coming of Jesus of Nazareth has impacted society and history in a way that no man ever has and no man ever will. And even if you were able to avoid him and his words and his claims, never open a Bible, never listen to anybody's invitation, never listen to any song that had to do with Jesus, he is inescapable because one day you're going to stand before him, and you're going to give an answer to him for why it was that you spurned his love, why it was that you ignored his sacrifice, why it was that you decided to trust in the fact that you were intelligent and self-resourceful and that you had perfectly enough of all you needed to get through your life. That day will come. When Paul preached to the intelligentsia in Athens, he made that very point, which eventually blew the congregation right out of the scene. Eventually, they said, oh, no, we've had enough of this. It was at that very point, the point I'm making for you now. He said that God, who created you, has, made, has established a day when he will judge the world, a day that is fixed, a day that is going to be fair, and a day that is absolutely final. And he says, and Paul says, preaching to them, and he has given proof of this by raising Jesus Christ from the dead. And at that, the people said, no, 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 we've got to get out of here right now immediately. What he was saying to them was, you're not going to be able to escape him. Simeon, remember, he says, this child is destined for the rising and falling of many in Israel. We pray, don't we, that there's going to be a great rising within Israel before the great and glorious day of our Lord. 
that he will not be a stone over which they stumble, but rather a rock upon which they find salvation. The wise man built his house upon the rock, and the foolish man built his house upon the sand, and the rain came tumbling down. See, where do you go when the rain comes down? Where do you go when the foundations shake? Where do you go when your best intellectual acumen has no answer for the diagnosis you've just received at University Hospital? Where do you go? He's inescapable. Secondly, he is not only inescapable, but he is completely reliable. How many, how many financial things can they put on the TV? Apparently, there's no limit. I always say this to you, but it's, I, I say a lot of things to you, but isn't it, isn't it just amazing how life has changed? I mean, how, how drug companies actually, they don't sell to the doctors, they sell to us, and then we go and ask the doctors for the stuff that we know we need, and we know we need it because they told us on the TV, you know, you need this. Go tell your doctor. He doesn't know. You better tell him. He hasn't got a clue. He's probably never heard of this. You need to go do this. So they market to us, and then we influence the medical world as if we know what we're talking about. It's amazing. And then, and then at the same time, the financial thing. Get the strength of the around you. Get the security of the around you. Yesterday in the Wall Street, same thing about the 3% program for your retirement and your security. And if you use 3% and add 2 and multiply by 6, you'll be bereft of anything by the time you're 82 and so on. It's just complete paranoia. And you're looking for something somewhere that is utterly reliable. Is there anything that is just completely reliable? Is there anything that can answer for me, not only in the face of my finances and stuff like that, but in terms of the actuality of who I am? And the answer is that Jesus is, is trustworthy. You can trust him with everything. You can, you can find the weight of your entire salvation resting on him. You can bring the most complicated affairs of your life right now, and you may entrust them to his wisdom. Try him and see. Don't tell me he can't. You never trusted him. He's inescapable. He's completely reliable. Those are the observations. Here comes the invitation. Let me ask you, will you have this Lord Jesus to be your Savior? Now, in a matter of a few days, I'll be here, and I'm going to ask that question to a young bride and to the groom. And I'm going to say to them, will you have this man to be your husband? And I am expecting a resounding yes. Otherwise, the whole thing to this point has been a futile exercise, and we've all got places to go and people to see. But without that yes, there's no marriage. They don't want to have to come back and say, well, I've been giving it some thought lately. Um, it's an interesting proposition. It's an intellectual journey. It's not brutal. I just asked you, will you have him? Yes. Good. Now, how about you, boy? Yes. We got a relationship. So I'm asking you, will you have this Lord Jesus? Will you enter through the narrow gate? Will you bow your head underneath his yoke? Will you confess your sins in the assurance that he's faithful and just to forgive your sins, that he will cleanse you from the guilt of sin and also from the power of sin? Will you have him? Will you? Because if you say no, that's fine. That's your deal. But I'm just asking you, and I want to tell you that you need him, and you need him urgently, because he alone has the words of eternal life. There is no other Savior because there's no one else who's qualified to save. You need him to help you live, and you need him to help you die. Will you have him? And finally, an affirmation. Here is the affirmation of the person who has bowed beneath the lordship of Christ, who recognizes that they are fallen, they're frail, they're sinful, and that every day of their lives they remain entirely in need of Jesus as their Savior. Here in the words of Annie Johnson Flint, I look not back. 
God knows the fruitless efforts, the wasted hours, the sinning, the regrets. I leave them all with him who blots the record and graciously forgives and then forgets. I look not forward. God sees all the future, the road that short or long will lead me home, and he will face with me its every trial and bear for me the burdens that may come. I look not round me, for then fears would assail me. So wild the tumult of earth's restless seas, so dark the world, so filled with woe and sorrow, so vain the comfort and hope of ease. I look not inward. That would make me wretched, for I have naught on which to stay my trust. Nothing I see save failures and shortcomings and weak endeavors crumbling into dust. But I look up into the face of Jesus, for there my heart can rest, my fears are stilled, and there is joy and love and light for darkness and perfect peace and every hope fulfilled. Look into your heart. Unearth your deepest longings and answer honestly. Have you found a way for these longings to be answered in this life? No, because you never will, because you were never supposed to. He's inescapable. He's completely reliable. Will you have him? You're listening to Truth For Life Weekend with a message from Alistair Begg titled The Magnificat. With Christmas coming, there is no better way to honor the birth of Jesus than to place your life in his hands. To learn more about becoming a follower of Christ, we invite you to view the video presentation you'll find online at truthforlife.org slash the story. While you're on our website, you'll have access to a variety of Bible study resources. Plus, you can learn how you can request our current featured resource. It's a unique book titled 40 Favorite Hymns on the Christian Life. This book is written by Leland Riken, who is an English professor, and he brings a unique perspective to classic worship songs like Amazing Grace, How Firm a Foundation, and Be Thou My Vision. This book invites us to experience these words as poetry, as we slow down and take time to savor these well-turned phrases, surprising metaphors, and evocative language, we gain a deeper appreciation for these beloved songs. And Dr. Riken provides key historical background to help illuminate the theological truths that are contained in these songs. Learn how you can request your copy of 40 Favorite Hymns on the Christian Life as you visit truthforlife.org. By the way, if your home church doesn't offer a Christmas Eve service, we want to invite you to join Alistair and the congregation at Parkside Church for an exceptionally moving, tradition-rich service this coming week. The Parkside Christmas Eve worship service will be streamed live this coming Tuesday, December 24th, beginning at 6 p.m. Eastern Time. The service features scripture readings, carols, and a special message from Alistair You'll find it online at truthforlife.org slash live, and it will remain available for viewing throughout the evening. I'm Bob Lapine, hoping you can join us next time for more clear, relevant Bible teaching from Alistair Begg. Today's program was furnished by Truth For Life. Where the learning is for living.